All right, everybody, here we are over here. Will, uh, Will is imminent. He's uh, logging in in a minute here. I just thought I would take the chance to say, hey, this is the Break It Down Show. If you like what I do, I'm Pete A. Turner. I'd love it if you watched on YouTube. That's a small ask, I think. And if you do watch on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It, uh, it enables me to use just a tiny little, little bit. Think about this. YouTube doesn't even pay me a penny if you watch. Not even a penny. A piece of a penny. And so if you subscribe, that at least gives you the chance to know, hey, Pete's gone live. And if you hit the reminder bell, it'll even let you even know even more. So that's a that's a big a big boost. When you're on YouTube, you can hit the super chat button, five bucks, ten bucks, whatever it is. Uh, that's that's what is the lifeblood of the show. When people are like, hey, how do you make money? This is how I make money doing this. That's you guys supporting what I do. You hit that five dollar button, the sticker button, all of these things, that engagement, all of those things equate to to dollars. So, um, look. I I, uh, I love doing this, and it's it's hard, and uh, it's costly, and I'd love to go back out to the desert. I got to get te- gas in my tank, and and if you know, I don't have a lot of money. I, I live pretty lean, but that leanness that gives me a lot of freedom to go do things. How do I get to go out and do more things? Your guys' support. So either you can always go to the PayPal link on breakitdownshow.com, and that link is scrolling across right now. You can put in your own subscription, five bucks, 10 bucks, 25 bucks. Some people do 50 bucks a month. And that I'm telling you right now, that helps me to create an ad budget. It helps me to get in the field. It helps me to replace my gear. It's about 110 in this tent right now. I think my glasses are steaming up. It's so hot in here. But that's a small thing, right? But at some point, I got to replace this tent. And at some point, it's pretty soon. My microphone's all screwed up here. Hold on a sec. So that support goes right into that. It's not like uh, we're, we're making me rich. Heaven forbid that ever happened. But the ability to do this show is, is really incumbent upon all of us working together. If you like what I do, five bucks, 10 bucks a month, maybe five bucks a show, whatever it is that you're going to do, you don't listen all the time. If not every show is your cup of tea, hey, when you see your cup of tea, throw a couple of bucks in the jar, just like you would for someone who plays the piano. I'd be like, hey, I appreciate you being here. Bam. Just something like that. Super simple. That's how you support anybody who has a podcast or some kind of creative endeavor. Support those folks who who go all in and say, I'm gonna create this thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna knit, you know, mittens or whatever it's gonna be. Support those folks. Go out and see local music. Uh, get those authors first books so they know that they can write another one and, and dig deep and go do that. So that's a that's a big thing. Hey Brad, talk dirty to us. I'm talking dirty to you right now. Down and dirty. It's hot in this tent legs and my knees are sweaty but uh will should be here he just texted me a second ago saying he was on his way let's see all right well we'll give will another couple minutes to get in here in the meantime uh if you don't know who will riley is he's he is a political scientist author very notable person uh famous in in his own world you know for talking about social issues one of the things he's covered is a thing called uh, hate crime hoaxes you know like uh, uh juicy smollett juicy smollett yeah. So when Jesse sets up this whole thing, it, it ends up being fabricated, right? What's up, Dickie? How are you, man? I get a chance to slow down and not to say what up to Dickie. What up? Normally we're mid show and we don't get to do a whole lot of that. But um, Will looked into these hoaxes and, and talked about how not only are these hoaxes disproven, but people tend to latch onto them and they, they miss the part about it being disproven. Or even if they are the hoaxer, you know, they, they stick to their guns like, no, this really happened. Like, actually, there's no evidence. It's the opposite of evidence. The evidence points to you doing it. And, and they don't want to let it go. And it's a crazy phenomenon where people are desperate for this kind of attention for whatever reason. And they like to use race to uh, cement that, that, that hurt, that pain. So he's written a lot of books on a variety of things. That's one of them. Hey, Aaron, what's going on? In 92 in the UK, it's been 92 in the UK, and it's set to be the same tomorrow and Sunday. Yes. Yeah, it is not terribly hot here in Southern California, but it is the middle of the day. It's so hot, my pillows that I just washed are outside, and they're in the sun, and I'm like, they are going to be good and dry in a short amount of time. Um, so, yeah, it's the summertime. Oh, that breeze feels good when it comes through the tent. <clears throat> All right, Will, where you at, buddy? All right, we're talking to Will live right now, trying to get him to come in the show. <clears throat> a little what up dicky action dicky how's it going hey dicky if you got any questions so i'm at me right now normally you get to comment and i never get to address you right now we got a few minutes here as will gets ready to pop in but 
uh, let's do that. I was talking a minute ago on another little uh, just check-in chat about my trip across the South. and I really wanted to spend some time in the South, and I went to the Edmund Pettus Bridge just trying to understand. Yeah, same thing with Will. He just spoke up, too. Um, I'm trying to understand, you know, what these areas are like, and I think it's curious about the South is that when the highways, when the interstates were created, the highways became de-emphasized for moving stuff. When the BRAC base closures started happening, these towns like Selma uh, lost their local base, lost that 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 anchor for their town, and these communities uh, became unmoored. And this has gone on. You talk to people from the South. This has gone on since the the Reconstruction. And if Lincoln had survived, maybe we'd be in a different country. But he didn't, and so the South has been made to pay a cost. And when you drive around these towns, man, I'm telling you, there's wrecks and there's ruins and there's just all this stuff. It's just tragedy and misery, not enough money. And then you get a society that is broken or doesn't believe that they can do anything or if they can do something, they get the hell out because Selma exists mainly from the surface looking that I saw because it's got a civil rights history. And uh, without that civil rights history, there wouldn't be any reason for someone to exist. The next time, next town down on the list, there's Bill right there, and I'll finish my thought here and shut up. The next town uh, west, as you go on US 80 away from Selma, they don't even have a gas station. They, they, they are too small, and they even have a gas station. So Selma is this town that has a civil rights history that they can sort of monetize and get funding for. But beyond that, a lot of the South just doesn't have that. So you have these little hamlets of people that, are largely forgotten about and lost, except for they can gather together and they can vote and they can change things. So, you know, that's my little thing on the South. I'll write something up about it. But first, I want to say hey to Will. Hey, Will, what's up, man? Hey, Pete, how you doing? I'm good. I was just kind of relaying my story of the South as I as I drove through it uh, a week ago, and I, you know, I took the uh, the less the path less taken to kind of really get a chance to interact with folks along the way. We discussed this on a radio show you were uh, guest hosting for. And it was eye-opening to talk to folks about what the South is and what it is not. I know from my angle here in California, we often look down upon the South and talk about it being a backwards place. Even like when we were getting ready for the Super Bowl, they had this uh, public health person here in California talking about how some people in some states, very like a bigoted approach to the conversation, will not wear masks and will not vaccinate because of, and it was just this prejudicial kind of approach to things. And I thought, man, we are so distant because the moment you leave California, California becomes the South to most of the rest of the nation. And it's an interesting juxtaposition where you have what we think are progressive people here in the West and backwards people there. And then everybody else I was talking to is like, you live in California? Oh, that's terrible. I'm so sorry. And it's not because it's not beautiful, but it's because our policy choices are unusual. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely that kind of prejudice toward the other man exists almost everywhere. Like a story I tell just relaxing and drinking is when I came to Kentucky from Chicago, all of my buddies in Kentucky, when they heard I'd lived on the south side of Chicago, were like, my God, wasn't that dangerous? You know, weren't there like black and Italian cats just driving down the street and SUVs shooting at random for no reason? And I had to explain like, no, I mean, you know, it's a tough neighborhood, but the University of Chicago is on the south side of Chicago. That's half the city. That's like Brooklyn. You know, you you live in a place, you, know, you have a gun, you have a gate. It's no. But I mean, when I went back to Chicago, I was actually surprised to see that in fact, my black and Italian American buddies had very similar perceptions about Appalachia. Like, Oh, you live down there? I mean, that's the real crime rate. That's deliverance. Um, you know, people would ask things like, are there animals walking around in the street? And again, where I live is the capital district of downtown Frankfurt. That's the state capital. You've been there. Like, it's a small city, but it's a perfectly functional one. Like, so in both cases, I think there's that automatic perception that kind of any area that's racially different, uh, any area that's known for crime of any kind, as both those are, is probably this unlivable hellhole. And in reality, my, my opinion would be, obviously, if you went to Selma, Alabama or Fresno, California or something, I mean, you'd, you'd probably notice where the hood is and avoid it. And there'd be different colors in those two places. But I mean, like you just go to town, you go get a steak. It, nothing would happen. And a lot of people don't understand this. A lot of people think like last line, but a lot of people think that if you went to Compton, like the downtown of the city or the entire states like West Virginia, just like getting off the plane, you'd be attacked. 
Like you would be unable to walk down the street and go to the store or something like that. And that's that's not realistic anywhere. So that, that's something to keep in mind. I think you might have frozen up, Pete. I'll just keep the conversation going. Yeah, so I mean that that element of fear is there all the time, and it is pretty unhealthy, obviously. And I mean, I think you've seen kind of a lot of the normalcy of the USA just traveling across the country, which is you know something I've always enjoyed doing. When I was a younger guy, actually, I used to buy these ten dollar tickets on Greyhound buses and just go to different cities where like girls I dated lived, or like a buddy of mine who'd played sports and had gotten signed by like some bullshit D three college because none of us are all that good. I mean, but like where he was staying, so I'd go to Iowa, I'd go to North Dakota, and it was it was just an easy, cheap way to travel. And you got to see the country. And I've, I've, I've since then I've seen a lot of military guys do that. I've seen again, a lot of former athletes do that. So I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Yeah. I know from working in Iraq, we would be all kitted up and, and you know, have automatic weapons and, and, you know, electronic warfare, countermeasures, all this stuff. And, you know, we're inside an up-armored Humvee. You look out the window and there's a mom and her kid just walking down the street. You know, like it's not, it's dangerous in an instant, but it's not dangerous all the time. And then regular folks got to do regular folks things like go to the barber shop. And I promise they're not wearing helmets. Yeah, I think that that's something that I recently put in almost social science perspective. Like I'm writing a new book about kind of legends and just bullshit things people believe. But I mean, like one of them was the idea that America is an extremely violent country in the first place. You've got blacks and rednecks and they fight each other, Mexican border. And to some extent, I guess I believe this too. But there's actually, I mean, there's a website called The Global Economy that's one of the better data resources out there. And they actually recently ranked homicide around the world again. And in the North American region, not even leaving aside your experiences in Iraq, because that is that is a bit of a different level. I mean, you guys face more danger over there. But like in the USA, there are 18 countries in the North American zone of the world involving, I mean, serious players like Mexico, Canada, Jamaica, uh, Puerto Rico's in there, Costa Rica, the Dominican. The USA is second from the bottom in terms of murders. We have about 4.5 to 5 murders per 100,000 people per year. We lose to Canada, but we beat Bermuda, which is an island paradise. I mean, we beat Barbados. I mean, we beat our own territories like Costa. Mexico is actually at the bottom. So, I mean, the, the fear people have is often based on not really, and this is true for racism too, it's just based on not really contrasting us with anything else. It's sort of contrasting us with the heaven. And that's not realistic. Like if, I mean, if you're in the army or you're in one of the professions, I mean, that's not the standard you're using to assess danger, you know? So I, yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with that, tra that travel comment and recommendation. And there's a reason for that. We tend to get real simple with the two. It's just black and white people, you know? And the reality yeah. is, is there's Egyptians, there's, I mean, Middle East, Middle Asian people, Middle Eastern people, they might be the same. They might be different people. Even describing what the Middle East is, we struggle to do. And, and when all else fails, we just use the stupid, uh, uh, what do you call that name? Uh, the name, I guess we'll say, of people of color. Ah, you all fit into the same category, which is really pretty fucking ridiculous if you're going to claim to know something about ethnicity and race and problems therein you can't boil down chinese and mexican folks into the same pile yeah i, I think that to some extent again the og tom soul said this 30 or 40 years ago I, I think he was one of the first guys along with arthur jensen who might have had different motives but he was one of the first guys to really break up the poc category and kind of look at it and realize that these groups all perform very differently that like Caucasian, and this is actually his argument against like genetic predictors of IQ, which we're still debating 30 years later. But I mean, his, you know, for example, Caucasian Hispanics often perform if you're looking at just income or something like that under black Americans. But on the other hand, Asian Americans kick everyone's ass. I mean, Chinese, Japanese Americans are the highest performing group in the country, Indian Americans, to the point where it's a cliche. So just saying POC, I mean, his argument actually as a conservative is that there's probably some attempt there to create this minority category that's going to fall under the white category by a pretty consistent level, like 10% when it comes to income and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you break out Cubans, who are probably the most oppressed Latino group, who are fleeing a dictatorship, 
or Dominicans who are black and Hispanic, or you go to Asian, you suddenly see, well, these people are among the most successful people in the country. And you have to actually look at this question of are there characteristics that predict success? And that's a lot more awkward than just saying, well, look at how the minorities are doing racism and just sort of pretending to ignore all the Asians and Jews and Cuban guys and middle class black guys. It'll be at every college. So there, there's clearly something else going on. The question is, are you willing to discuss it? Yeah, one of the things that Thomas Sowell talks about is like people disagree with me, but they don't bring any data that repute, refutes what I'm <laughs> what I've studied and found. And, and we get stuck with this thing where Thomas Sowell, I mean, he, he, like we talk about our our you know inability to deal with race and everything else. And in Congress, we have an anti-Semite black lady who was a refugee. She's Arab and she's elected not once, but twice to Congress, right? Like that's as, like that's as available to anybody as you can. I mean, this is a person that's a lot of things that you would instantly say that will never work, but here she is representing Congress. I mean, that's what part of the things that makes us a great country. If the folks in her district want her to be there, she can be there and there's nothing any of us can do about it because we're not in their district. Yeah. Even the fact that Minnesota has a, large Somali community and after, you know, some, some decades of struggle and failure without false, you know, being too politically incorrect, they're now doing okay. I mean, it's, and yes, Ilhan Omar is a congresswoman representing that region of, I think, Minneapolis. So, I mean, that, that talks about a lot of things. I mean, again, the idea that you can go around most of the U S and see, you know, this interesting range of people, but also, yeah, sure. I mean, like the immigrant lack of excuses. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure there's a deeper point there, but, Yes, Ilhan Omar, def I never thought about that in kind of a positive way. Like, yeah, Ilhan Omar kind of represents hustle to some extent. I mean, she came here from a Kenyan refugee camp, um, which sounds like the starting point for like a third world hip hop group as versus, you know, the U.S. Congress or Senate. But yeah, I mean, she worked hard. She got excellent marks and she was able to dodge these crazy scandals. Like, I mean, she allegedly had either a faux marriage or an actual relationship with her own brother. And like my reading through Somali spot and some of these fairly big regional boards and papers, you know, indicates that's probably true, but that didn't really matter. I mean, she had a notable affair with the guy who was, you know, funding her campaign or whatever it was. And they're married now, I think, you know, but she's just kept working hard. American success story. God damn it. That's right. But it is true. I mean, that you can if you can do that, what, what can you not do? Like, where where are the bounds that like, uh, you know, not this. You can't do this. And look, everybody's got to hustle. Everybody's got to get up that mountain. And uh, it's not easy. But, you know, and, and she's not the only example. I had a lady on my show when I did my popping the bubble show. And she said, I left Brazil because I wasn't taken seriously as a female entrepreneur. And I knew where I could go to be taken seriously. And that was the United States. And we think of Brazil as being a fairly successful, progressive place. And she still had to leave that to, to come here for the opportunity that's available. That doesn't go to the whole um, lack of equality for, for outcome or, or, you know, I mean, any of the equalities. There she is. She's picking this place that's supposed to be horrible. Yeah, I, I think there's a weird, so there's actually a weird contrast between how Americans feel about America and how other people feel about America after years of our left and right, especially the left going back and forth and bashing each other. So Americans think crazy things about the country. I mean, the, the three stats I always use are without getting into 20 studies, one, we think we're one of the most racist countries in the world. Like a huge percentage of young black and for that matter, white, like high school age Americans think we're the only country to ever have slaves. So, I mean, many people believe this this type of nonsense. On uh, number two, we think that there's an incredibly dangerous. We just touched on this one, but the day to day life is incredibly dangerous. And that's often kind of classed or racialized. So like the Skeptic Research Center, I don't think we've gotten a chance to talk about this one yet. Mm -hmm. But recently did like this well done kind of large scale study where they found that the average liberal American thinks that between a thousand and ten thousand unarmed black men every year are killed by cops. So, I mean, they yeah. surveyed hundreds of people and they asked them, like, in a typical year, how many unarmed black men do you think are unprovokedly killed during violence with the police? And it was like 35 percent of the people in just the standard liberal category said, well, it's about a thousand, it's easily at least a thousand. Another like 15% said 
said it was 10,000 and 8% said it was more than that. So, I mean, the average was 5,000 or whatever that would break down to. And I mean, the thing that's crazy about this is that in a typical year, there are only 15 to 20,000 murders in the USA. And I mean, we're overrepresented, but only about half of them involve black people. So, I mean, these people thought there were as many cop murders as there were murders. And this, this sort of thing is very common. Like another study getting into just generalized fear, last one, but came from Kex TC, like the great, I think, European consultancy. But they asked a bunch of Americans, this is in like 2020, how, what percentage of the population they think has died from COVID-19? And the estimate from a pool that looks like it was mostly upper middle class women was 9% of the population, like one in 10 people is dead or one in 11 people. Right. And at that point, COVID-19 had killed maybe 200,000 people out of 350 million Americans. So Americans tend to think crazy stuff about the country, like it's wildly violent. It's the most racist country in the world. If you actually either look at the numbers or talk to people in the rest of the world, they actually have a much more balanced view. Like you guys strike me as a little chubby and corrupt, but I mean, it's every year when you look at the immigration numbers, where do people want to go? It's America and Germany, maybe like Australia. Uh, and I mean, the Germans aren't letting that many people in. You know, it's there aren't of the high performing countries like Japan, France. This is one of the few where you really have a chance of coming in as a black guy or an Eastern European and just yeah. kind of settling down. Almost every other country is way more openly racist than we are, interestingly enough. Like in Britain right now, they've got like white on white racism because black Britons actually perform pretty well, apparently. But like they have an issue with the Albanians now, the damn dirty Albanians, as comments are describing them. Like some um, MOP member of parliament came out and said that within a couple of years, one in 10 mothers in Britain could be Albanian. And that's just unacceptable. And for all of America's flaws, you just can't imagine someone doing that. You can't imagine a blonde Anglo or like a black Southerner, some traditional American coming out and saying, these damned Puerto Ricans. I mean, it's just over the line. Ship everyone home in a boat. I mean, so like there's that there's the real America, which is what we're describing now. And then there's this odd perception of America, which is mostly drawn up by people that really don't like America by radical, not infrequently foreign origin academics and so on. One of the premises from my travels this year was that there are lies in that little black box that sits in front of your uh, T, you know, that your TV set, you know, that, that thing's just full of it's a lying machine, right? And when you go out and encounter people where they're at and what they're doing, they're going to complain and they're going to holler about things. But it's not look, it's not climate change. And the other thing I want to curl in with this is when you go, when you understand a specific set of people in any kind of way at all, like and I'll use Texas as an example. If you're in West Texas, you have a pickup truck. If you look at the dealership, it's all new trucks. It's not it's not small cars. Right. And then on top of the pickup truck, they've got uh, what they call a slip tank as an extra tank because, hey, you have to be your own gas station at times. You also have to be your own provisioning element. So you got to bring supplies to and from the market. You've got to do a lot of this work yourself because they don't have uh, all of the things that you might want to have. Sure, maybe there's a Walmart 200 miles or 150 miles away. And it's a fact. You can leave San Antonio, which is squarely in West Texas. And you can drive for three hours and get to Del Rio, which is on the border of, t yeah. of Texas and Mexico. And if you want to go further into West Texas, you can. It's 188 miles to Alpine. And it's 90 miles to Terlingua. You're still in West Texas and you're just going further and further away. And you're still nowhere near El Paso. Right. And so these folks have to be their own logistics in a lot of way, whether they're hauling a trailer full of livestock or just bringing back milk, you know. They're, it's just not the same area. So again, the black box, the TV is full of lies. And then you go and you look at how someone has to live and survive. And um, look, they, they can't live in a, a community where you stack housing above, you know, a, a sandwich shop and a copier, you know, these little self-contained lives that doesn't work in a place like Midland, Texas. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's correct. Um, I don't, I don't really know what my, my follow there would be. Well, one of them actually is just, again, that I think that does get into why people misunderstand one another. We're living to some extent in different countries. And by that, I don't mean the treasonous, like left or right, like there's going to be a big war. No, there's not. The army would just smoke everybody and 
people gather for a <laughs> battle, you'd start seeing cluster bombs drop out of the sky. That'd be that. And get off your damn ATVs, go home. But I mean, like, beyond that, though, Air Force, actually, I guess there. But anyway, beyond that, though, people really don't understand the living situations of other people. So, like, I've been to the high west, and just the area of land is something that's really striking to a lot of people from the cities. So, like, a lot of people think about the East Coast or about density as being Bosnia wash. Like, you start in New York City, and you go down through a little Boston. Or I guess Boston is north of New York. And then you you go to D.C. Now, as a Chicago, and I view two of those cities as fairly small towns, honestly. I mean, they're not any larger than Detroit or Indianapolis. But, I mean, that that's actually kind of the point. Like, in reality, the sort of Bosnia wash population densities, at least in, like, two-thirds form, extend to like the inland cities on the Great Lakes, where within 100 miles or 200 miles, you have Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit. I mean, they're a bit less glamorous, but they're as fully, uh, nearly as large as the cities I'm describing. You have these other massive towns. I mean, there are five major cities in Ohio. I mean, you go down three hours from Chicago and you're in Indy or you're in the heartland Illinois cities, blah, blah, blah. So people from that area can talk kind of a good country boy line. Like you've got the woods around your house. But when you get out into the West, you really see a different level of scale. There's actually a song about this called something like Miles and Miles of Texas, which is just about this son bitch driving across Texas. And he's naming all these towns. The song's like five minutes long. But I mean, it's like, well, you start here and you're 120 miles and you're here. Texas, I mean, Texas is the size of France, roughly, if I, re- if I wasn't lied to in high school. Then there, there's Alaska out there. There's North Dakota, South Dakota. So, I mean, the, there's a point here, though. When people, we sometimes get caught up on these limited racial questions and so on, and we ignore more important things like regional rivalries and density differences. So, I mean, like, the reality is that someone in New York is going to be asking a series of questions about planning that someone in North Dakota who's well-educated, went to UND, you know, is active in politics there, is not really going to understand. So, like, the whole idea of why do we need all this rural electrification kind of stuff? Like, can't you just in the city you know, go down to the computer cafe. It's like, look, you don't understand the starting points of what we're doing here. I mean, like there are houses out here, they're still using individual generators because they're too far from town. And by town, I mean a settlement of 12,000 people. So yeah, that's that's definitely a reality. There are, there are a bunch of other things like that too. I mean, and that the country is very racially segmented. So we act like there's gonna be some kind of ethnic conflict as diversity grows. Not really. Not only do we like each other pretty well, it's also growing in different areas. So like when you go to the Southwest, parts of, say, Nevada or New Mexico are Hispanic areas. Like everyone's polite. Everyone's a normal taxpayer. But it's if you do anything, you do business, you go get food, 95 to 100 percent Hispanic. On the other hand, if you are up in, say, Idaho, at least an equally high income, pleasant area versus the Hispanic area I'm describing, but everybody's white. I mean, so it's just when people estimate, for example, how common their own ethnic group is, every group overestimates, especially blacks. We put it at like 35 percent. America is only 12 percent black. The issue, if it's even an issue, is that the black people are concentrated in black areas. So if you go to Detroit, everyone's black. But if you start moving west, that's not what you're seeing. So a lot of a lot of different things going on. I had to switch out ice packs because it's so hot here in the tent. <laughs> um, yeah, really? I'm, I'm glad that you're seeing. Are you, are you out there in like, the desert country? I'm, I'm in the well, it's Orange County, but it's still it's warm and direct sun. One of the things that goes with all of this is this term lived experience, and I can appreciate that your lived experience is your experience, and in a lot of ways true to you. But if your lived experience is not based in actual fact. How do you deal with that? How do you take these people that throw lived experience out there? Yeah, like, but yes, but you're wrong, <laughs> like categorically, statistically incorrect. How do we deal with these things? I, I think lived experience is almost worthless. And I mean, I don't I don't mean that I guess a better way to put that would be I think that a lived experience is just a single data point or it's an anecdote. So I mean. I recently had a weird debate where I was taking on the feminist role with a female friend who denied that there was quote unquote rape culture in America. And I think the term is stupid, but I was saying, I mean, coming from like the rave scene where my friends and I used to throw parties coming from like the male Greek scene. I mean, although that that wasn't a focus of mine, but I mean, it was well liked in college or something you did, but I mean, like coming from that, that environment, the trading floor scene, like, I'm not sure that's true. 
Um, so, I mean, I think that was an example of a contrast of lived experience. I mean, this was a pretty girl with five brothers and she was like, I just don't see it. I see women getting treated better. And I said, well, I mean, I've seen a lot of women kind of getting dogged because my friends used to own businesses like nightclubs. So we, we had a conversation about that friendly enough. And I think in that sense, lived experience has value, but it's also worth noting that like there is national rape data and there, there's also data on female mistreatment of men and male mistreatment of women, you know, how many beer parties are busted up every year by county. So we actually know the overall statistics that relate to the topic that we're discussing. And I view this as much more valid. So very often the idea of lived experience, like a lot of ideas in academia, comes out of, and I don't want to sound like a conspiratorial sent right guy, but comes out of sort of a weird communist narrative that's not true, which is basically the idea that all of data or all of the scientific method is what's been referred to by, I think, Derek Bell as your master's tools. So you can't trust that stuff, right? Like whites and the upper class are manipulating the data to make themselves look better. Now, in reality, in the modern academy, the exact opposite of this is true. But nonetheless, so what you need to trust is what you've seen and what you've experienced. Like if you feel you've encountered racism, you have. So you should note that down as a typical example of racism. And when whenever anyone speaks to you, you could say, I don't care about your numbers, which are fake. I have my numbers, which come from my experiences of racism. The problem with this is that it rests on two assumptions. One, that modern, integrated, not even universities, but serious government agencies like the Bureau of Justice stats, the Crime Stats Boys, are just making things up which absolutely is not true. I could have a very boring show where me and you just go over this. But I mean, that's assumption one. And assumption two is that you're right, which has a profound level of arrogance to it. I mean, if you asked me, even as a chubby older guy, like what percentage of women in this room do you think are attracted to you? I guarantee you I'd say something over 60%. Now, is that true? I don't know, maybe. You know, I have a job and money now, but it can also be bullshit. It can also be 20%. Who, who knows? You have to go around, and ask everyone for dates, gather data to see anything, to get anything valid out of that, that starting assumption. So a, a lot of lived experience stuff is just, in my opinion, people's made up opinions of themselves. Uh, I, I tend to ramble, so I'll cut this short. I, I My funniest example of this, I do pretty large scale data gathering every couple of semesters because I teach our big methods class and I use that as a chance to do some practice surveys and that kind of thing. And one of the questions on one of my surveys is how do you self rate your attractiveness? And for like African American and Appalachian females today, it's like 90% would say I'm a 10. And that's lived experience. Like, well, men hit on me, you know? I mean, like you have the lived experience that you're the most beautiful woman in the world because you're in a, you're in a happy relationship and you're in a pretty small competition pool. Frankfurt's got maybe 100,000 people. But your lived experience isn't real. So that's, that's important. Just someone saying, this is how I feel is inherently meaningless. I feel like I'm an emperor, like I'm an automatic majority wherever I go. Um, but that's not true. Well, and the other thing, and I like to use this example, is like you say, hey, how many of you here are hard-ass warriors in the room? You know, everybody can raise their hand because, yep, exactly. of course, they will. The reality is, is that half of them are below average, at least in that room, you know, and maybe you've got an exceptionally gifted room, but, you know, that regression to the mean, it's a motherfucker, and it'll grab you and snatch you back real quick. So I wanted, just wanted to make that bit of a joke and observation. I wanted to, this is a thing I've been... Um, thinking about is California is an exceptionally tough place to, to regulate and legislate. You know, it's a, it's a huge, not as big as Texas or Alaska, but it's definitely more complex. I mean, you have um, Southeast Asians and Indians who come here and have completely different mindsets than kind of our liberal white left uh, enclave that do technology, but they work together in the same building, you know? And, and so it's like, you have the Asian guy who's making sure his kid is swimming laps every day and playing the violin and, getting all A's in his class while you have, you know, the, the other end of this, like they completely opposed things. And then you go a hundred miles to the North, you get North of Sacramento and it's a lot more, it's that state of Jefferson area where it's like, we'd like to break off and be our own place down here in Southern California, way different. You go out to the deserts, way, way, way different. We also have the benefit of having two enormous, really three enormous bays that we can bring cargo into and then charge a tax. Like, Hey, to come and use our, our things, and so we generate just mountains of money on things being moved within and, and through our state. But we, so we have a 60 plus billion dollar surplus right now. And we have, I don't know, a million, half a million 
200,000 homeless people on the streets that we're just bewildered. What, what are we going to do with these people? Is it unfair? I mean, is California so hard to manage and they're, you know, therefore like the U S then did to be too tough on politicians who can't quite get this stuff right? Well, I mean, California is a country sized state, but I mean, I'm, I'm actually profoundly unsympathetic. I mean, people manage countries all the time, right? I mean, I think Clinton yeah. and Bush, the first, did a decent job with America. So, I mean, it, yeah, even Trump did some things that I like. I mean, it, so it, obviously people are successful at the leadership level in much larger entities. I mean, I don't, I don't think the UK prime minister or the president of Nigeria or something like that would have a lot of sympathy for California and saying, well, we just can't manage the state. I think the problem in California actually is that it's so big, but also so complex and multiracial that you have dueling mythologies, which make it very difficult to get anything done. So, for example, I could solve the California homeless problem in a week. Um, I mean, I would just give everyone a bus ticket back to where they came from. That might sound simplistic and brutal, but I mean, I guess there'd have to be stages to this. Like you'd pass a simple vagrancy law. I mean, you would. So stage one, you pass a simple vagrancy law. Stage two, you offer people treatment. California has some of the best mental health treatment in the country for all its flaws. You don't want to leave injured former veteran, injured veterans. You're not a former veteran out there, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, step three, if people absolutely refuse that, you throw them in county jail. This is what we do in Kentucky, by the way. I mean, we have pretty major cities like Louisville, Lexington. I mean, they're not Chicago or L.A., but we got plenty of bums. It's just there's a different standard of treatment. Like you're warned a couple times by the cop on the block. And I mean, our cops still spin blocks in cars or they walk. And after that, I mean, you get your ticket. And after that, I mean, I would presume there's an arrest. You very rarely see someone not move on to kind of an unaccompanied park area after they've been told, like, well, we might give you an ass kicking and throw you in jail, like in subtle, more polite language. But I mean, in California, so step two, step three is basically you do that. Like if people resist, you send them back home or you put them in jail. And it's weird to hear people, someone just saying this in kind of calm, blunt words, but it's what people have done through almost all of human history. There's no moral problem with this whatsoever. I mean, you're protecting the small children and business women and so on that are currently walking through piss-stained homeless encampments to get into, for example, the state capitol. The reason you can't do that in California, but you could do that in most of the places I've mentioned, Nigeria, any individual region of Britain, Norway, is that there's such an extraordinarily heterogeneous population where you've got, I mean, someone just mentioned in the comments, we've got first generation immigrants from Vietnam. Um, you've got an enormous amount of guilty white liberals. You have the Hispanic population that was actually kind of the first incomers there. I mean, you have, uh, you'll go to LA, large aggressive black community that's to the left of almost anyone. So it's hard to get into a city council meeting, say, that includes all these different types of people and propose something commonsensical and have it pass. But even there, though, I think it would if people just did this. I mean, when you look at like the kind of Newsom class leadership in California, there's been an incredible like French Revolution era disconnect from what the population needs, in my opinion. And I'm not just saying that because I lean toward, you know, the pachyderm side of the fence. I mean, you were seeing them do shit like eat at the French laundry which I've thought about going to. I was traveling on pretty high-end business trips where it's just like, no, there's no way I can justify that. But I mean, eating 20 deep, like in the group room during COVID. I mean, I don't think that that guy understands how big the homeless and drug problem has gotten, one, or two, would sacrifice liberal cred to help out what he probably thinks is a bunch of multicolored, poor people that should be working in like a nanny capacity for him. So the problem itself is very easy to solve, you know, arrest people for a misdemeanors. Um, what The problem is the will. The problem is the leadership class. California actually is interesting in political science, because unless you're talking about completely third world countries, like, you know, where Dr. Doom is from in the comic books kind of thing, it has the highest disparity in wealth in the USA, and this is something important to remember about the blue states. Like people always say, like whenever I say something right leaning from a Kentucky perspective, people always say things like, well, your state's a lot poorer than mine. But at the same time, that that's not really true in the sense that most people mean it. I mean, there are definitely some redneck and African-American slums in Kentucky, but there aren't ghettos of the kind that you'd find in Detroit or barrios of the kind you'd find in L.A., the reason there's a lower average salary is that most people are more condensed around the mean. 
So in California, you've got something like a third of the nation's billionaires, right? So, I mean, you yeah. have those guys making enormous amounts of money. And then you have the ordinary Honduran mom who's walking through this pile of junkies. So, I mean, I, I think that dis disconnect, extreme disconnect in wealth makes it harder to govern areas. I would much rather live in an area. In fact, I do. This is the conscious decision I made with urban Kentucky, which is kind of in that middle. I would much rather live in an area that is average income. I mean, we come in at 58,000 per household per year, something like that, but where there's very little disparity in wealth, where your neighborhood's wealth range goes from like unemployed every day of the week, union bus driver up to a local lawyer, then live in an area that has a higher average income, but where there are massive wealth gaps. So people don't feel like brothers or cousins anymore, where you have a block where there's one millionaire who made his money in the market, who lives in a brownstone with fences all around and alarms, dogs in the yard. And then you have a bunch of other multiple occupancy units. They're doing that weird Yimby thing where you shove like a near project building up next to a high rise apartment that all the places I've been to like that central Minneapolis, so on are, are extremely unpleasant to live in. So, mm. you know, give me the logical option. I love it. Yeah. California is full of uh, rich people. I mean, you hire Bono, he comes down from Malibu and he plays the Hollywood ball and he's, I don't know. He's not even, he might be a billionaire. He might be a single billionaire. That's what he might be. He's one of the most successful, famous people in the world. Meanwhile, you know, like Zuckerberg and his like three tiers down from his MLM scheme at Facebook, they're all multi-billionaires. I mean, it's easy to find billionaires walking around the streets out here. Millionaires are like, that's nothing. That's adorable. You know, you got um, what, what else are you into, man? I know you're working on a book right now. Do you want to talk about that? What else is on your, uh, on your mind? Sure. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a writer, so I do a lot of writing. I mean, my priority, actually, I always hate it when guys use cliches, but is teaching the kids. Like, I'm also, I'm a full-time college professor at uh, KSU, the Kentucky State University. Um, one of the, in addition to being a solid state U, it's also one of the many historically black colleges in the country. Now, this is interesting because, again, we're, we're in Appalachia, or at least the Appalachian foothills. So, I mean, the, the population and the poverty population here is extremely heavily Caucasian. So we're, we're faced with kind of some interesting questions. I mean, it's an HBCU, but it's close to half white. I mean, we can't break the law either. So just an interesting, interesting school across the board. But in terms of writing, I mean, that's that's kind of my secondary job. So I write pretty often. I try to knock out 2000 words a day. Uh, the most recent thing I wrote was actually a piece for Spiked magazine, the UK men's publication on the collapse of this sort of mass grave thing in Canada, which will also be in my upcoming book. Are you, are you familiar with this, with what happened? I am. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, what, what do you think about it? I've been doing a lot of the talking. What do you think about this crazy story where they said they'd found hundreds <laughs> of dead Native American kids at one of these residential schools, and it turns out they didn't, apparently? Like, they're rescanning? What, what's, what's your take? Uh, you know, it's... Uh... I don't know enough to have too much of an opinion. It's it's uh, it's such a crazy thing. And there wasn't the Catholic Church woven into this thing for a while or something like that. It's just. Um, yeah, well, just for people that aren't familiar with the story, I mean, even at our level, what happened? So the Kamloops Native Residential School hired a well-known left-leaning researcher, and I mean well-known and left-leaning are separate, the person's pretty good, but to scan like the grounds of the old residential school. Residential schools were like boarding schools for native kids that have become very kind of politically incorrect in the, in the recent past. But someone was hired to scan the grounds of the school and look for bodies, essentially. There was a, there was a rumor in the area that native kids have been sort of snatched away by the priests at the school or people that were sent to the school would disappear and never come home. And this had been investigated a few times by the police. There'd been no confirmation. The police included native officers, but the, the person scanned the grounds and they found like 200 um, abnormalities in the soil. And this became a story that was international. The argument was that Presumably, the school had either been killing these kids or just letting them die, letting them take ill and die. And there was this massive area in back of like this app, this gloomy apple orchard on the school campus where these kids were buried. And this became an international story. And I mean, like the Pope commented on it. Justin Trudeau, who himself has been known to enjoy dressing as a First Nations Canadian, 
um, talked about it as, you know, the shame of the country. The New York Times ran an article. And the general thrust of it was that these bodies had been found, that this is one of the worst civil rights atrocities in history. And when myself and other kind of heterodox, really empirical guys like Professor Bouillard, if I have that correct, in Canada, started looking at this, it turned out that there was nothing. Like the kind of ground scan radar that they use finds any disturbance in the ground. But if you ask the, the people that produce that technology or you ask the people that have reviewed this so far, they'll say that those kind of quote unquote signatures could come from, you know, rocks or tree roots or pretty much anything else. Like they haven't found any bodies whatsoever, actually. And it doesn't look like they will. Like the without going on too long about this one story, like the school is not like isolated in the middle of some kind of Transylvania style forest. It's in the downtown of the city of Kamloops, which is also on like the Kamloops Indian reservation. So you have all these institutions from the tribe and from the city that's a little bigger than Frankfurt, like all around where this was supposedly happening. It also turns out that the school kept a record of all the kids that died there. And there were only 50 over about 100 years. So there, there's not really any place that they would have gotten 200 people from. So this is, this is another instance, in my opinion, of something that I've looked at a lot recently, which is kind of narrative collapse. I mean, right. Jesse Smollett and Bubba Wallace and Michael Brown and Jacob Blake and so on down the line, it, Covington Catholic, like the Erica Thomas. These stories will become massive very predictably in the U.S. and the U.K. and to a lesser extent Canada if they involve kind of these points of conflict around race right. or class. And they never turn out to be true. That may be a slight exaggeration, but like I can't think of one unless you're talking about mass shootings or something. That's really just turned out to be the initial narrative that we were we were told about. So this is this is another example of this kind of failing almost certainly. I, I actually have some recommendations in the article, like they dig and they look for bodies. You know, if the kids are there, honor them, bury them in, in tribal fashion. But I think the thing is that we all kind of know they're not there. And so now the tribe and sort of the left wing, the Canadian government, politics don't really matter that much, but are sort of refusing to do this. Like that's awkward. That's iffy. So this is another thing that's going to kind of fade into the ambiguous murk of this this whole debate. So I, that's the last thing I wrote about. But um, I actually have a book coming out um, really kind of when I get book, it in. I want to add something because with this particular incident, yeah, and you, just, you stop knowing what to believe anymore. It kind of fades into fact. Yeah. We know that Bubba Wallace wasn't targeted for anything racist. And this is in your book, uh, Hate Crime Hoax. But people, even if they know it's false, like, but it could have happened. And like, there's all these things where it's like, yeah, but this didn't happen. More importantly, someone perpetrated this thing. And, and look, any PhD is going to have to do a better job of studying this stuff, right? I mean, or at least publishing and saying, see what you can figure it out. But we don't. We allow this narrative to continue and it becomes true. There are people that believe that Jesse Smollett was, uh, was attacked. And it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, the thing with this is that Jesse Smollett actually understands this narrative, like this idea. When we talked about most blacks and most white liberals believe that a 10,000 unarmed black men every year are shot by the police or one right. to 10,000. Jesse Smollett strikes me as someone like college educated, funny dude. I mean, he identifies as black, but his uh, father actually is like a Russian Jewish immigrant a genius from his his homeland. You know, I mean, Smollett is probably pretty well read about all this stuff. So what he's done is never confess and actually risk jail so he wouldn't have to confess. So his pitch is don't trust him. Even now, you know, they say I did it, but there's no way I would have done this. I did not do this. He's 100% sticking to his guns. His argument now seems to be that like his working class Nigerian buddies who beat him up actually committed a hate crime against him if you listen to him talk but he's still doing it just brass balls like he's still doing interviews because he understands that if he says this there's going to be a consistent 40 percent of the population that overlaps really well with his audience that's never going to stop believing him because they believe this whole narrative and that's why there's actually a fairly deep point here that we get into with like trump recently but this is not uncommon this use of kind of a mythology is the word that comes to mind 
to make points about the country. So like um, Pramia Jayapal, if I have the name correct, recently posted, you know, Mike Brown was murdered on this date six or seven years ago. Hands up, don't shoot, never forget. And I mean, this got a lot of, you know, hate retweets and mockery on Twitter and Facebook, but it also got thousands of likes because there's so many people that believe that because Michael Brown has become a myth, like the innocent black man who was murdered in cold blood as he stood crying with his hands up. And in reality, all this was complete BS. Right. Like, I mean, the Obama Justice Department cleared the, the hero cop, Officer Darren Wilson, who ended up shooting Brown during this life or death struggle. I mean, like Brown's DNA is on the slide and trigger guard of Wilson's gun. Yeah. Brown, I'm sure, had some good qualities, but had committed like a brutal strong arm robbery like that day. Like he'd yeah. beaten up this small Asian store owner, stolen a box of blunts. He was like walking down the middle of the street with the stuff he'd stolen when he fought Wilson. So that is reality. And it's not disputed. Like a black president's leading lawman cleared Wilson. Right. But the, the important thing is that 20, 30, 40 percent of the population still believe the myth. And more importantly, they believe that the debunking of the myth falls into this your master's tool space like it can't be true. My lived experience is that the cops are bad to do kind of a, a pullback there. And so I know what really happened there. The problem with this kind of thing is that looking at the narrative on the right, which is almost invariably bullshit, or looking at the right wing response to the narrative from outlets you've been trained to hate and disdain, like the Daily Wire or even my own fair, 1776, um, a lot of people don't know what to believe. So this is we've just seen this kind of like Rashomon effect recently with these. Have you been following this Donald Trump nuclear secrets thing? Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, I, I, I am aware of it yeah. also. This is yeah, I mean, like, so I just have to jump in and say something, I, I you know, this whole thing about like, what about her yeah. emails? This whole thing has come back to life. It is fact. You cannot have TS, SCI, including all the other secrets on your home server. It is impossible for that to legally happen. Right. But that this it's a sub whole thing where like where you've adjusted to truth. You also if you're going to have your subject interview that week for for failing to secure classified information, you don't have your husband go on to Loretta Lynch's airplane for an informal meeting. Even if it was informal, nobody believes you. And her, Hillary Clinton's election chances went down. You can see it in the graph. Bam, a big hit. And she never got that hit back because all of this stuff is, I know people, every, every ethnicity you can imagine in the army that I work with, and we're all like, we would all be in jail forever if we had done this thing. We would be a traitor, a spy, all this other stuff. And so whenever they pursue these things, people ran on. And like, I'm not a Trump fan. I got to say this out loud. I'm not a Trump fan. I am not a fan of bullshit either. So when people yeah. ran saying, I'm going to impeach Trump, that is not a policy. That That is, a, you know, you can't trump up something to go <laughs> get the man because you hate him, you know, which is, in fact, what they did. And so now when they go and they do all this stuff, whatever crazy arm waving insanity they want to bring up, they've. They've bullshitted so much. I don't even care. By the way, the guy in charge right now, a rating, he's mm -hmm. going to approach congressional disapproval ratings here pretty quick. So let's get, keep our eye on the ball and let's get something fixed here and deal with it. I mean, it's just, it, well, it's infuriating as a counterintelligence agent when I find out that, yeah. you know, not the only Chinese spy, but there's a Chinese spy on Dianne Feinstein's staff. And again, if I'm running that agent on Diane Feinstein's staff as a foreign agent, boy, that's my entire career. They'll give me millions of dollars to run that thing. And Swalwell, and look, and if there's those two, there's 40 more throughout all parties and everything else. These are real things. We can't import electronic equipment for our grid from China without having a massive counterintelligence scanning of that thing because we don't know how it's, how it's been exploited. Not if, it's been exploited, right? So all this shit goes way in front of Donald Trump and anything he may or may not have had at Mar-a-Lago. And it's just, it's infuriating. I don't want anybody to get away with anything illegal. I don't want to, I don't want to justify anybody's bad behavior. And Donald Trump deserves a lot of this negative attention because he, he, uh, he sows that, but let's focus on, on, on getting some structure and some, some confidence back in our institutions. Cause I can't tell you how many people I've talked that they're completely disillusioned by the FBI, the IRS, all these other agencies, because they uh, they struggle with the truth. 
That was a bit of a rant there. Yeah, the I, I think there's a lot. No, that's, no, that's cool. I agree with you. I, I think there's a lot there. Like, first of all, I don't see why but her emails isn't supposed to be an acceptable response to the Trump thing. Like the whole, the reason people are, people say, but her emails is that Hillary Clinton was literally bleaching and burning hard drives and destroyed something like 33,000 probably classified, probably confidential emails that she had at her home. Like she was using a home server to do governmental business. I mean, you and I both know how crazy that is and both know people that couldn't hack it. So I mean, she was the secretary of state just sitting on an ass in Chappaquiddick or whatever, like sending emails from her house. So the, the whole claim there was that she illegally had classified material at home. That's exactly the claim against Trump. So I, I don't see, I would have had no problem with the, the polite Trump style raid on Hillary Clinton whatsoever, honestly. And in fact, what the FBI did by announcing this, like we're formally investigating days before the election was even more devastating. So those two, in fact, are very close parallels. And I mean, this kind of thing is pretty common when you get up to people in the higher echelon who are going to be targeted as potential assets or are going to be targeted with agents, right? I mean, like, so Swalwell to me is the one that's just funny. Like every time Swalwell mm -hmm. posts on Twitter or like his Facebook public page, something like, can't believe what Ted Cruz got away with today. It's like, you're, you're going to say something like dishonesty in a speech or a poor tip at a restaurant. Whereas you fucked a Chinese spy for a year. Like you should just shut <laughs> up. You should get off all social media and build bridges with your wife, man. Like, what are you doing? But I mean, yeah. it's like, it literally, and the, the whole thing is so ridiculous. Like the spy's name was Fang Fang. I mean, just, you know, anyone who's seen traditional porn can see a couple obvious jokes that come out of that. I mean, they apparently had nicknames for each other. Like I've read, I don't know whether this is true. It's like Reddit stuff, but that his nickname was Little Panda. And like they had an affectionate <laughs> relationship that went on for a while. You know, so you can come back from that, I suppose. But yes, you're absolutely right. Most people who are breaking flash drives with a hammer that contain governmental information or who are, while in, say, a military position, screwing a foreign spy are going to be in very, very serious trouble. I mean, you're talking about career ruining issues, if not prison for maybe one to three. So I, I think all these cases are pretty similar. But the reason I brought up Trump, actually, was that I think this gets into the fact that nobody trusts the media on either side anymore. So it's very problematic to know what to think about situations. It, it sounds kind of sheep-like to say this, but if journos have one job, it's kind of telling the normal mainstream what to think within a range of reasonable options, like honestly presenting the data and saying, could be this, could be this. And when you listen to like old Walter Cronkite, you know, that, that's generally, you could have enough of a level of trust to say this guy leading slight left, but what he's saying is probably true. And I'm going to choose from among these options. Now there's so much wordplay and so on going on that this becomes very difficult. So like, I actually read the Washington Post bombshell story about this. And what I noticed is that they didn't say that nuclear documents had been found at all. What they said was the search warrant gave license to look for nuclear paperwork and five or six other types of paperwork with that, the five or six others being like agate type, like a sentence down. And I mean, I trained as a lawyer and it strikes me that that's just a typical search warrant. Like mm -hmm. every warrant will say, like, we give access to the premises to the following policing agencies and you're going to be looking for any of the following things, drugs, guns, child pornography, knives of a certain style, you know, whatever, stolen property. That doesn't mean that the person is a pedophile who's also a serial killer, who's also a fence. It just means that you want to give access to the property, to the residents, for officers who can look for a bunch of different shit. So like the, the presentation of this is they found nuclear secrets. They didn't find anything or they would have announced it. I've never not seen a police department or the feds do that. And the nuclear stuff was one of eight or 10 things that they could look for per the search warrant terms. But you had to be almost a legally trained writer and researcher to figure that out. The common layman's take on the article would be Trump had plans for a bomb. Like the big bastard was trying to build nukes at Mar-a-Lago. And you're seeing these kind of jokes again on Twitter and FB and so on. Like, guess it was just a fishing expedition from Paul Krugman and so on. And the reality is I Trump has a lot of good points, a lot of bad points, but we all know he's not sitting around in the Mar-a-Lago basement 
with like a coked up son or a pretty Russian secretary, like building nuclear weapons. That's, that's not who Donald right. Trump is. So it's you understand at some level this is BS, but without having a range of capabilities that go from law to journalism, it's hard for you to tell why. So a lot <laughs> of people just kind of look at this and scoff and say, like, I don't know. I just don't believe it. For some reason, I don't believe any of it anymore. And that, that's yeah. a problem, actually. That's really problematic. Well, and again, you had Hillary Clinton saying, I did it and I take full responsibility. And there was TSSCI on the server and nothing happens. A couple of guys got a sort of a letter of reprimand, but they'll get taken care of later on. Uh, Justice Department also proved nothing against Barry Bonds other than he was an asshole. I mean, here's a guy that clearly <laughs> did steroids. And they're like, that can't convict him. So if they can't convict Barry Bonds and they can't convict Hillary Clinton, what the heck are they going to do with Donald Trump? They're not going to be able to do anything. I mean, it's it's a miracle they convicted Michael Vick, but he, you know, he he was mean to dogs, so we really cared about that all the time. Well, that that was a weird one to me. I mean, like, obviously, you shouldn't be fighting dogs in your house. But I mean, like, we recently saw Deshaun Watson, um, you know, well-known QB, about on Michael Vick's level, um, in all honesty, across a bunch of different metrics, like same ethnic group, same position, similar salary. But I mean, he was accused of sexual assault, I won't say rape, by like 30 right. different women. Like, he was apparently going into these mostly physically small Asian massage therapists and just making crazy requests like, I want you to wax my booty hole. I mean, if, if like if you read the transcripts, it's funny stuff, but it's horrible. And like, what about oral? Uh, hands not enough at the end. And some of them did it, some of them didn't. But like 30 of them filed reports with like their professional society or the police. Someone apparently called the team. And Deshaun Watson was suspended six games. Yeah. Like six. I mean, he he was not charged criminally. There's not a civil lawsuit. And the NFL took him out for six regular season appearances. And I think a preseason game. And I mean, it's hard not to contrast that with Vic, who was fighting some dogs and who was sentenced to jail, who became this national figure of calumny. I mean, my understanding is that less than 10 dogs died, although that could easily be wrong. And like, people, of course, that's bad, you know, but it, it's, yeah, it's a right. weird contrast. Like one of my friends, uh, Adonis Jones, pointed out that if Michael Vick had did what he did with humans, like if he had a mostly consensual fight club that maybe didn't kill you, but resulted in some severe injuries, and this went on every weekend at his house, he probably wouldn't have been charged with anything. No one would have been particularly unsympathetic. The idea is that he was doing this with these cute, innocent animals, and that's that's what got him got. But I mean, the, yeah. the broader point, though, I don't really see anything happening to Trump either. I mean, to some extent, some of this is just nature and potential like trump and biden are both 80 or close biden is i think 79 so people are talking about this like these are two young vigorous prize fighters that are going to go at it again i mean there's about a 50 50 chance trump would die before the conclusion of something like a four-year investigation or right. tr trump or biden would before like a contested full year election ending in 2024 so i i don't see that occurring justified or not but I also would agree that it's not it's not going to be justified in any normal sense. And one last kind of jump on point about this. That's true for a lot of these cases. Like, I still remember Chris Rock talking about Bill, Big Bill Clinton back in the day, the Trump of the left. But I mean, he was Chris Rock said, like, look, Clinton's obviously a crook, which I wouldn't disagree with him on, although I like Clinton. But I mean, the stuff he's being charged with is shit I didn't know was crimes, to quote him. Like, he gave his friend a job after they had a sexual relationship, but one, he did that in the context of the government, and two, he lied about it. So that's mm. technically two low-grade felony charges. And the audience was just cracking up. Like, yeah, sure, we should we should crack down a white-collar crime, too. But at some level, we all know that this is not equivalent to hitting an old lady over the head with a brick and taking her purse. So... If Trump is convicted of anything, which he probably won't be given the age issue, given the extreme partisan rancor that would cause, it would be the same kind of thing, like lying to the FBI kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it's obvious why they're doing it. There's a political element. He pissed off a lot of people. J6 was embarrassing. Um, I personally would prefer my money not be not be wasted on it. But no, I don't I don't see him spending a, d a day inside. And. Yeah. No, I mean, that's it. The the one other point you could make is just this is so extremely partisan from both sides. Like everyone hates that labeling, but it is, it is correct. Like, I mean, Hunter Biden is smoking crack on video with potentially underage prostitutes in other countries. Like, boom, full stop. 
I mean, we're not going to do anything about him right now. When the Republicans take office, is a lot more of my money going to be wasted chasing him around and seeing if Joe Biden got 3% on such and such a deal? Probably. Yeah, 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 for sure. Back to Deshaun Johnson, Johnson uh, Jackson real quick. Uh, wasn't wasn't Tom Brady's suspension for being more likely than not, not even like for sure, did it six six uh, six games for potentially letting the air out of a football? Is it the same suspension? And this stuff is crazy. Yeah, yeah. race thirty <laughs> runs. <laughs> I mean, like yeah. deflate the balls. You know. Games. Yeah, little little air out of the ball. Six yeah. games. No big deal. <laughs> well, listen, yeah, it's, man, it's weird. I mean, I guess. Yeah, it's, I mean, definitely deflate gate was that, but that is correct. It was the three, two, six games, but yeah, he was out for a while. It was a very comparable suspension. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I, I got a couple of the guests lined up. I'm going to have you on for, and look, it's always a pleasure. I wish I was able to come out and swing by Kentucky, but I went South this time next year. I'll of make course. sure I come by Kentucky. Sounds good, man. Yeah. And I mean, hopefully we'll do some more episodes. I actually know a bunch of people that want to talk to you, like trans detransitioners, like some former spies. I mean, like just a bunch of people. I get a bunch of podcast requests and I'd be I'd be very down to do some of those episodes. So I hope to I hope to talk to you again soon, man. All right, let's do it. Right, stand by for one sec while I shut this down. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. And right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching the Break It Down Show.